Hey, today we're going to use Excel for your genealogy research. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we would want to do that. And if you are not an Excel user, this is the video for you because this will teach you how to do some of the basic functions in Excel to help you with your genealogy research. Now, why would we want to do this? We want to do this because it helps correlate evidence, if nothing else. We can outline all the census records and line up all the family to make sure that we have the right families. We can use it to help resolve conflicts such as a birth date or a death date or some other fact that we have in our ancestors profile. By outlining all of this stuff in Excel, we can then correlate the evidence. We can weigh the evidence. We can take a look at what uh, what is important and what is turns out to be probably the likely reality, say a birth date, for example. So really what this is about, we're going to talk briefly about what you can do with Excel, but this is really more about how to use Excel and some of the functions, especially for those who are new to Excel. We're going to go through some of the basic functions and a little bit of more advanced functions. You do not need to know math. You do not need to write formulas, although maybe we'll talk about one or two little formulas that are super easy to write and will help you uh, create birth dates. Okay, so we're going to jump into all of that, but if this is your first time here, my name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further faster and factually with your family history research. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. Genealogy TV has a website, a newsletter, and a Facebook page. I hope you'll get hooked up with all those. Those are going to be in the description box below the video on the YouTube channel. Now, if you want the handout for this episode, uh, you'll need to either be a channel member here on the YouTube channel, or you can join us at patreon.com forward slash genealogy TV. Those will get emailed to you. All right, so now uh, let's get on with the topic at hand using Excel for genealogy. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is a little bit about how you can use Excel before we start getting into how to use Excel, okay? So here is a very simple correlation of the birth record for Christiane Beck, who was born in Denmark. So as you can see, I've got a column here of what the documents are. And then I've got when the document was created, which helps us evaluate the validity of the document. And then I have either the estimated birth year or the actual birth year listed in the document. This is a very simple version. Now I use this in an academy, one of the Genealogy TV Academy uh, lessons recently where we dug into a lot, I mean, very deep dive into all of the different uh, correlation of records and how we could do that. We also got into using Excel spreadsheets when we were using pre-1850 census. So if uh, that is something of interest to you, join the Academy. It'll be available there. So this is just a simple version of a correlation of evidence. Now we could also jump over and take a look at how we could use it for DNA matches. In this case, I have removed the names of the living people, and, but I left the centimorgans in here. Here we have the different generations. So I was trying to decide, these are all the cousin matches, and if, you, if I scroll to the right, you'll see lots of them. And here I am over here. I had a, a, a cousin take a DNA test. And so we can see by Centimorgan count our different relationships. But the reason why I outline it in an Excel spreadsheet like this is because we want to pay attention to the generational differences. Here is a one times great grandchildren of the, of the common ancestor. So the common ancestor of all of these DNA matches might be either at this level or at this level or at this level, or at this level, or way up here at this level. But we need to pay attention to the centimorgan count because if we have centimorgans that are 
say a first cousin twice removed, it's going to have a lower centimorgan count than say someone at one generation closer. And so by outlining it in an Excel spreadsheet, we can evaluate which line that we connect closest to. I know that's, there's whole other videos on this, but long story short, you know, I can, I can evaluate a through line, if you will, similar to what Ancestry does on their through lines, but using Excel spreadsheet and all the cousin matches from all different services like 23andMe and Family Tree DNA and all of the MyHeritage, all of the different DNA companies. If you have cousin matches by using Excel spreadsheets, you can combine them all into one place. So that's just another idea of how you can use this. Now we're going to get into how to use Excel here in a, in a minute, but that is another example of how to use Excel to help outline your DNA matches. So here's another example, and this seems to be a popular favorite. I did a video on this a while back. So this is where I was trying to resolve a problem. And so what I did was I took all the records that surrounded these ancestors, including the fan club. For those who are not familiar with the fan club, that's friends, associates, and neighbors. And I pulled all of these records, and I'm gonna scroll down so you can see them. I pulled all of these different records right? Lots and lots and lots and lots of records. I mean, the list just keeps going. But the cool part about this is, I'll just show you the first one here. So this is one item, okay? And these were bastardy bonds where uh, my great-grandmother Rebecca was naming Jesse Gibson as the father of her uh, soon-to-be-born child, and so every person that was in those documents, every document, could be a will, could be land deeds, whatever it was. I listed them both by first name and last name. And the reason I did that was because I was able to create filters. If I wanted to filter down to just Davis, I could do that. And now I can see that there's Davis, Davis Jr., Davis Sr. Well, this also helps you if you have variations of spellings of names. So when I click on that, you can see that I have a truncated list of just those people that are by the surname of Davis in all of these records. This can be very helpful. I could take that one step further and I could uh, filter the first name to Joshua. And now I look, I have three different ways that Joshua was showing up in records. So I can click OK. And now I've got a short list. He appears in item number one, item number two, item number four, five, eight, and so on. You get the idea. So he appears in all of these records that are somehow related to my great grandmother. So this can be wildly helpful. Now I'm going to show you how to do all of this here in just a minute, but let's, let's just think about that for a minute. The thought that you can do this kind of correlation of ancestors and or evidence is huge. And by doing that and filtering, you can filter by all kinds of things. I mean, you could, you could, the possibilities are endless. So let's jump into how we're going to do that. So there is a handout for this, just as a reminder, the handout uh, again for the channel members, for the patrons at Patreon, and uh, you can buy it at the genealogytv.org website. So all of that information that is in that handout is really about how to use Excel more than it is about the details of every type of template that I've ever created. Um, there are templates available on various other handouts that I've done in the past and I will leave links for that in the handout as well. There are three ways you can get the handouts. Now the first way is to join the channel membership here at the information access level channel membership on the YouTube channel, and then go to the community tab and you'll find the posts that have the handout links in there. All you have to do is follow the link and download the handouts. Okay, now the second way is over at Patreon. Now at Patreon, if you're at the happy dance level or higher, uh, you can get the handouts. Those come directly to you in an email every time we announce the new video that has a handout with it. You'll also get early release with that membership. All right, and then the third way is just to go over to genealogytv.org, 
and click on the handouts tab and you can find all the handouts there for individual purchase. So uh, I hope that was helpful. The handouts really do support the channel and for that, I thank you. All right, so here's the deal. You can create, you know, if we have a simple, simple blank spreadsheet, you can just type into a cell, right? No problem. You can also resize a cell to make it bigger or smaller just by hovering over the space between two cells. All right, we can, when we are highlighted on a cell, we can hit the delete key and just delete it. There's some simple little basics. When you're talking about genealogy, some of the simple things that you can do is create a column for name and let's use Joshua since we were using him a little bit ago. Joshua Davis. So I put his whole name in there. I could do separate columns for first name and last name if I wanted to. So if you hover over between the A and the B, see how Joshua Davis is going into the cell to the right of it. Well, if I type he's 34 years old here, it cuts him off. So if we hover over this column and we double click, it expands to the width of whatever that last cell is. Well, I don't need it to be that wide, so I can grab it and drag it back. And if I want this to be standing alone in its own cell, I can highlight this cell and I can say merge and center, or I can hit the drop down and just say merge across, or I can merge the cell and leave it uh, justified to the left. A lot of times I just use merge and center and it will automatically center it for me. Okay, so here we have birth date and birthplace. Now let's let's do something. I'm gonna squeeze this down so it's obviously not looking good. And I'm gonna squeeze this down. Let's say let's say we had this goofy looking set. We could actually highlight four columns and double click. Remember, I double clicked on the right hand side of that and it resized everything. So that's kind of neat. But wait a minute, what if you have a ton of notes in here? Well, first of all, when you're up in this part of the ribbon, you can hit this drop down and make it bigger. And you can hit the Alt key on a on a Windows, I think it's Option on a Mac, and then hit Return and then type a second line. Alt key, Return type another line. Okay, so if we hit wrap text, let's squeeze this down, and we hit wrap text, it makes the row now wider to fit all the text. And as we move it back and forth, it can fit and truncate as we wish. If we don't like that space at the top, we can move this up. If this was really big like this and we didn't like this big space, we can hover over the bottom edge of this. If we hover over this, we can double click and it'll pull it up to the space that is needed. So if we have a birth date, let's say 1922, it's gonna format to a date because it recognizes that as a date. So if we wanted to change the format to something other, we can make it text, we can make it all kinds of things, right? We can make it text if we wanted to. A lot of times I'll leave dates the way they are. If we could say birthplace, too much text. And then if it's overlapping like that, we could go double click. So here in the source column, I mean, this all this is very simple, right? This is a name, an age, a birthplace, a birth date and a birthplace, a source. So what if we wanted to take a hyperlink from say Ancestry? First of all, I don't really recommend you do that. I'd rather see you write, you know, the Randolph County Courthouse death records or whatever the source, I'd rather you actually type out all the details of a source citation, but I know that you might want to put a link in there. So let's go, let's type hyperlink to Ancestry's record. Better yet, let's say this is the, I'm making this up, you guys. This is totally off base, but let's say this is the 1850 census. So we want to make sure we understand what it is. Oh, and it, and it's running off. So we're going to either wrap the text or we're going to double click the column. I'm going to say wrap the text. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run over to Ancestry. I'm going to pull up that 1850 census. I'm going to view the image because I want to get all the way down to the actual record. I'm going to grab the hyperlink, control C to copy or command C on a Mac. And I'm going to come over here. Now I've got it copied. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to come to the insert tab and I'm going to say link. 
and I'm going to click on link and I'm going to paste in control V to paste and I'm going to paste that in. Now that's a hyperlink. So I'm going to close out my ancestry completely and I'll show you. It gives me that hyperlink. I click on it and it opened in another another window, but there it is. Okay. So that's how you can do a quick hyperlink. So one of the things that I want to warn you about with Excel, this is probably the only program that I know of that does this and it drives me crazy, is it's not saved anywhere right now. Make sure that you come up here and hit save as and save your document where you want it to be. Alternatively, if you had just hit save, it would ask you where do you want to put this, but still save early, save often. Those are words of wisdom from a family member that has saved me more than once. So save early, save often because Excel does not automatically save unless you have a OneDrive account. If you flip this button on, it's going to want to save it to your OneDrive account. And so I leave it off because I like it on my computer instead of in the cloud. But if you want it in the cloud, uh, then you can use it that way and it will automatically save every few seconds. So save early, save often if you're saving to your computer. So a couple quick things here. I zoomed in and as you can see, you're getting these hash marks here and it's because it needs to be a wider cell for the amount of data that's in here. And so if you just grab a hold of this and pull it to the right, you'll see that. But if you're still here, you can also just double click like we did before and it'll open it up. Okay. So the other thing that I want to point out is let's pretend for a moment that this is a mistake. You typoed, right? You go, uh oh, I made a mistake. Well, there's the undo button right there. And so you can hit the undo button. And the cool part about Excel is there are 16 levels of undo. So watch this. I'm going to say undo that put that one back. I'm going to say undo again. It's going to change the width of that cell that I just changed. I'm going to say undo again. It's going to put it back the way it was. I'm going to say undo, 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 undo. It's changing the size because that's some of the things I did. Well, there's also a redo button and the same goes for redo. You can sit there and redo, redo, redo. Now, if there is a shortcut, keyboard shortcut that you want to use, you can use control and Z to undo and you can use control and X will completely highlight that cell to copy it. And then you can control uh, V to paste just some quick shortcuts. Alternatively, if you want to grab this cell and you want to move it around, hover over the edge of the cell where that is highlighted, right? We've highlighted the cell. And when we get that four arrows, we click and we can drag it up or we can drag it around. We can move it anywhere we want. We want to put it back here. We can let go. Okay. And this little tiny handle here, right there, when you get this black plus symbol, you can click on it and drag it down and it's going to copy that cell all the way down. So that's a nice little feature. If you want to highlight a bunch of cells to delete them, we can highlight those cells and hit delete and they go away. Bye bye. So those are some of the just basic functions. If you want to insert a column, let's say we decided we want to put mother's birthplace, say father and mother's birthplace, like you would see in a census record. We can click on the header. This is where the E is, not down in the cells, but up here so that the whole column is highlighted. And we can do one of two things. On the home tab, we can hit insert. And it's going to push, it shows you, it's going to push one to the left. So we can say insert, even though we've highlighted the whole column, it's saying insert cells. To me, this is more confusing, but it inserted a cell when I click on that. Here's what I like to do. I'm going to control Z to undo what I just did. And if I want to insert a cell, I again click on the column that I want to push to the right. I'm going to right click and I'm going to say insert. I find this so much easier. And then I know exactly what I've got. So then I would say father's birthplace. And now I've got that. So now let's say that I want to do a mother's birthplace. So I'm going to, again, I'm going to push this column F to the right. So I'm going to right click. I'm going to insert a column. Now, instead of typing all that, all I have to do is grab that little handle, drag it to the right. It's going to copy fathers. I'm going to come up here and change this to mothers. And now I've got uh two columns added to my overall document. So 
you can create this as you want. Let's pretend we want to do first name and last name. Again, right click, insert a column. I'm going to grab this handle. I'm going to push it to the left this time. So that copy the name. I'm going to say first. And now I'm going to say surname. And whoops, I typoed. So all I have to do is come up here to this is the formula bar. Uh, click up in the formula bar backspace and get rid of that little mistake. Now, because first name is running long here, I'm going to click on that. But here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change this to Joshua and I'm going to change this to Davis. This way I can filter these columns separately. So now I can drag this if this is going to not be wide enough for some of the other names in here. And so let's pretend for a moment, I'm just going to copy this down. See, I grabbed the handle and I copied it down. So you can do that with more than one cell or more than one column. Okay, so what I've done is I went and created some, some real people in my tree and their birth dates. So the popular thing that everybody wants to do is to create filters. Well, you can create a filter for one specific column by coming up here. You click the down arrow and I use this filter. And then what you can do when you click on that down arrow, it gives you choices. So if you want to deselect all and you want to pick only the records that show up for 1810 or the birth dates in this case, then I would get a short list of all of the records that were Joshua Davis in this case is showing up with the birth date of 1810. So to go back, see that little tiny down arrow inside the, it shows the filter icon as opposed to this field over here. This is telling you that this is filtered. So by clicking on that again, we can see what the filters are. Okay. We could actually add some more. Let's say we're looking for somebody with in a certain era of time. We don't need these other dates, but we want to look for all the records in this specific time. We hit OK. And now we're getting everybody that was born between these dates that we had selected. Another idea. You could also correlate the same kind of thing with birthplace. Now, see how this has got these little double headed um, lines between five and nine it kind of gives you an indication that there's stuff hiding in there. You can click and drag that open, but that's not really going to do anything. So I'm going to double click that back. We'll have to come back and hit select all in order to get the entire list back. Another trick you can do is extract information from census records. So here I'm in the 1860 census for Joel Davis. And I did a whole episode on how to do this, but in the quick and dirty conversation about that is to click on this little icon here to open up the index. You don't really need the image at all. You can come up here. You can click. I'm going to click on the headers as well. So I pick up the headers and you can highlight as many fields as you want. Control C to copy or command C on the Mac. And then you can come over to your Excel spreadsheet. Here's a blank spreadsheet and you can paste it, but you can't just paste control V just puts everything in one column. So I'm going to control Z to undo that. You have to right click and paste as special. And then when you say that, then it, you pick text. Now this only works on the later versions of Excel. Hit OK and it puts everything in here. And then so the trick here is to go, you know, five or 10 pages in either direction of your ancestor on on the uh, census documents, right? So that you can pick up the whole community. And that way you can find other, da uh, other Davis, in this case, other family members living in the neighborhood. So you can do the same thing again. You can highlight all these cells. You can double click to make them fit properly. You can then add a filter by coming over and hitting the filter icon. And then if we want to just truncate to just my Davis ancestors, I would deselect that, click Davis and hit go. And that gives me all the Davises that are in that 1860 census. Of course, we would want to label this as the 1860 census in Randolph County, North Carolina. 
and I typoed there, but you get the idea. So again, I did a whole episode on this and I will leave links for that in the show notes as well, but it's basically, this is kind of a method that I created a, a, a year or so ago. And that seems to be wildly popular because it's a lot faster than searching on Ancestry. So another thing you can do, I'm gonna unfilter this. So I'm gonna hit select all. You could actually type, for example, Nance, and it's going to truncate to that. Now I'll show you that in another example in a minute, but that is a quick way to get straight to the name that you're typing. But the only thing is when you type that, if there were variations of that name, you're not going to see it. So then when I click OK, then it's just going to truncate that whole list to just that the records with Nance in the surname. Again, I'm going to select all. So let's talk about coloring cells. You can, let's say this is somebody of interest to us. We could highlight the cells and we could come up to this bucket and we can choose some colors if we just want to use yellow. I usually use the lighter or pastel colors to help highlight because especially if you're going to print those dark colors don't print well. The other thing you can do is you can highlight the whole row by clicking on the row and then hit the highlight button and it will highlight the entire row. Sometimes this is helpful to see uh, items, but here's another trick you can do. So let's pretend for a moment that we want to highlight all of the Gibsons. So I'm going to deselect, I'm going to say Gibson. And now I've got just the Gibsons and I'm going to highlight these two rows and I'm going to give them a green color. And now I'm going to deselect and now those people are uh, highlighted green. So let's pretend that I want to highlight all of the Davises just so they jump out at me. We're going to make them yellow. We're going to highlight all of those. We're going to say yellow. Click the down arrow, pick the, the yellow. And it, by the way, if you don't like this color, you can come down here to more colors and let's pick a pastel color. Like let's say that yellow instead of that bright yellow and hit OK. And now all of those guys are this pastel-ish yellow okay and now i'm going to deselect and now you can see that all of the davises in this community are now yellow i could just simply this since there's only one cooper it appears i can give them a different color i can pick all the pickets this way if i wanted to and give them i don't know a pastel blue nance is kind of a standalone here i could give that a different shade of green I can then pick the Hamiltons down here and give them, I, let's give them a peach color. So you're getting the idea. So this can help us really quickly see all of those in the community with colors. Okay, for the sake of demonstration purposes, I have moved back to my DNA cousin matches. I'm in this column here. So more than likely these people down here are younger than me, just guessing, but I don't know. It depends on how tightly packed the generations are. But uh, so my point being is you can label these however you want. Um, but for the sake of demonstration purposes, I want to show you conditional formatting and I'm going to um, create a copy of this um, tab down here. And by the way, you can colorize these tabs. You can you can color the tab yellow. You can create a copy. So I'm going to right click. I'm going to come up and I'm going to say move copy. So what you have to do here is actually click this extra button, create a copy. And you're saying before sheet, whatever the next one is. These two I can't show you because they have DNA information in them, but I'm going to click OK. And now you can see that there's a number two here, which basically is showing me that this is a copy of this one. So I can rename this by right clicking and hit rename and I'm going to say conditional formatting. So you're going to like this. You'll see why. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop for a second and I'm going to change some of these to where they're just numbers. So here you have 12 centimorgans, you have 10 centimorgans and so on. I'm just going to change them to a number so the conditional formatting will work and you'll see why. Okay. I've changed all, all these to remove the initials and as you can see, I have done that all the way across. Oh, I forgot this one. So I'm just going to type 34 and I left myself here so that you could see where I am in the grand scheme of things. And so back here on the left hand side, but all these colors are still here. 
I can remove all these colors within one click. So if I come up here and I click on the, the conjunction here of the rows and columns, I just click there and I highlighted everything. And then I can come down to the fill bucket, click the down arrow and I can say no fill. And it removes all of that. Now, why would I do that? Because uh, I want to do conditional formatting on all these cells. So I can, let me come over here to where this will be a little more obvious. <clears throat> By the way, you see some red colors here. I can change that too. I can right click and I can come up here to the uh, font tool and I can say automatic to change everything back to black. And now everything's back to black. Okay, now why would I do that? Why would I do conditional formatting? What is conditional formatting? Conditional formatting is basically saying if certain conditions are met, change the colors. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll to the left and I'm going to grab all of these cells. I click and drag, right? Left mouse button is still down. I'm dragging, 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 dragging all the way to all the DNA cousins in the entire file. And now I've got them all highlighted. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here to conditional formatting and they've got some predefined conditions for you. I use color scales for the sake of genealogy and I like this one, but watch if I hover over them, depending on the number, it depends on how the colors change. So I'm going to, I could highlight, I could use different ones. You just have to play with it to see what you like the best. I typically like this one because the red shows me the hot zone and the cool colors show me the cool co zone, you know, kind of like when we were kids playing, you know, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, right? So I'm going to click on that and now I'm going to click away just so you can see it. Now I'm going to zoom back just so you can see the color scales. All right, so I'm right here. I'm going to colorize that yellow again so you can see me. And now you can see where the centimorgans are higher than some of the other areas. Now, some of the some of the dark blues are very small centimorgan counts and probably aren't really viable. At 6 centimorgans, I wouldn't call that viable. Okay. So, now we can tell that more than likely. Now this is the test taker. This is my my cousin who took the test for me. He has the highest centimorgan count to me. So we know that we both descend from my great grandfather, Henry Gus Henley. Okay. So now as I'm trying to decide which of the many brothers, so there are brothers up here, which you can't really see very easily. Here's Joel Davis Jr. He's one of the brothers. I'm trying to determine which one of these guys is the father of my great grandfather. And if I'm using just autosomal DNA alone, the Centimorgans from Ancestry and other places, these are females. So I'm going to highlight Joshua Davis and Exum Davis. So these are the brothers from which one of them, the yellow, is the father of Henry Gus Henley. Now, I outlined him here because of these hot zones right here. And let me zoom in. If you were to look at just DNA alone and without any pedigree collapse, you would think that Joel Davis Jr. is the father of Henry based on the fact that these centimorgans are hotter from one, two, three, four uh, descendants of Lorana Edith Davis, who was the daughter of Joel Davis. Now, I know this is all complicated and it's like, you know, DNA conversation and not so much Excel, but this is how you can quickly use conditional formatting, but you have to be just using a number. You cannot have other text in the fields. All right, we're going to jump back over to our 1860 census example because I want to show you how you can use a simple formula to help calculate birth years. So let's pretend this is not the 1860 census because it does show birth years, but let's pretend for a minute we don't know these birth years. So I'm going to delete that and I'm also going to get rid of the colors by clicking in the upper left corner. I'm going to hit the drop down. I'm just going to get rid of all that for the sake of simplicity. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. 
All right, so let's pretend for a moment that we don't know the birth years of all these people, but we do have the ages listed here. In fact, we can't see this one, so let's open that up and see what it says. Ah, 12 October. Well, this is because we extracted it from a census record. That is actually 10 over 12, which means the child is 10 months old. Okay, so I'm just going to put that in there. Now, when I do this little formula, I'm going to show you this won't work. And let's pretend Rebecca here is, I'm going to totally make this up, 25 years old. Okay, just to have something in this cell, let's say Joshua is 25 years old. Let's, I'm just going to add some numbers here to, for the sake of demonstration. So in this birth field, I'm going to highlight the first cell. This is the formula. This is so easy. This is the 1860 census. All you have to remember is the equal sign. Equals. 1860 minus and then this cell we want to highlight that cell so now it's saying this cell here equals 1860 minus e3 that's all you have to remember hit enter and now it says 1825 now instead of typing that 28 times all i have to do is grab this handle when it turns to the black plus, I'm going to click and I'm going to drag. And it's going to copy that cell or that formula all the way down. Bada bing. Now when you see something like this that says a value and it says error, it's because of this. This is not a number. Okay? So I'm just going to delete that. I'm going to highlight the cell and hit the delete key. So now we have estimated birth years on all of these people. But when you click around, you can see the formula is the same, but it's changing the row. See, this says 1860 minus E13. This one says 1860 minus E14. So it automatically knew to do that. Here's another little trick. You can teach Excel. So let's say we want to number some columns. So I'm going to say one, two, three. I can highlight these cells. I can grab that little plus and drag it down and it's going to remember that I wanted to copy that. Let's take that one step further. I'm going to delete all of those and I'm going to say 2, 4, 6. I'm going to hit enter and again I'm going to tell it. I'm basically highlighting all those saying this is my pattern. This is the pattern I want. I'm going to click and drag and it's going to give me all the even numbers. Kind of cool, huh? Okay, I want to show you one more thing, and let's pretend for a moment that you have done a lot of work. Let's say this is really long document, and you want to just copy the, the names and, say, the birth year to, other, to another spreadsheet. So you can open a new spreadsheet and just click the plus button to open a new blank spreadsheet. I've got one already open here. And what we can do so I'm back on sheet number two what we can do is we can copy all of this simple enough control C to copy and go over here and uh, control V to paste again I can highlight the columns and double click between the right hand side to help fit better then I can also say uh, birth year because we're going to capture it from the other side I can also make that bold by highlighting the entire row and hit bold and now I'm going to come and I'm going to bring the birth years over from over here in this column. Now I could have simple enough, I could have copied this and then deleted the other columns, but let, you know, maybe you're doing something more extravagant and you want to take this birth year and bring it over here. But instead of copying it, what you can do is what I call this equals that. So I can say this equals sheet number two this birth year because William Pickett is the first one I'm gonna say enter while it's highlighted and it put 1825 over here and you can see equals sheet number two cell F3 simple enough right now we can grab this handle and drag it down to bring in all of that but one of the things I want to warn you is I had to take out there was a infant in here somewhere that had 10 months which kind of threw everything off 
So just be mindful of that. It doesn't work when you have some sort of goofy cell in the middle. So I'm going to grab this handle. I'm going to drag it down and it brings all of these dates over from this other sheet. See this ended on 1820. This ends on 1820. So we've got uh, that information over. And again, if I wanted to filter, I could either highlight here and hit the filters and it's going to filter all of these cells because there was at one time um, some sort of detail in here. I can turn this off and actually anywhere I click in here, it's going to, it's going to um, put filters in there. Okay. <clears throat> so that is a quick way that you can then bring in just information with the, what I call the, this equals that formula. And you can do the same thing with other, other data, say birthplace, this equals go over to the other sheet and say birthplace and hit enter. And now North Carolina is listed there. I can click and drag it all the way down. And it's, it, as you can see, the formula is coming over. See, it says line 13, sheet number two, line 13, sheet number two, line 13. So here's the cool part though. Let's pretend for a moment that I change this to South Carolina. Now, when I come over here to sheet number three, this is now South Carolina. I hope that was helpful. As you can see that there is a lot that you can do with Excel to help you uh, organize your records and your DNA cousin matches. Just to name a few, the handout is available for the channel members. You can also find it at genealogytv.org for individual purchase there and also at patreon.com forward slash genealogy TV. All right. Well, there are more videos on the screen that relate to how to use a deeper dive on Excel right now.